Welcome to the Explores. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. We've got one more episode to go in our epic season two lineup, but it needs a little bit more time in the oven. But I didn't want to leave you hanging in the meantime. So in honor of this year's Valentine's Day, I give you a bonus episode from the Patreon vault. It's about, among other things, two women in the ancient world who became fast friends and weren't afraid to fight for each other. This one's for all of my Galentines, the patrons who help keep the Explores going, and everyone who's ever listened or spread the word. You're my favorite. Grab a bottle of wine and your very best jewels. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons who made this episode possible. My newest pirate queens, Cassandra, Shelby, Jamie, Johanna, and Charlotte. My newest lady presidents, Bibiana, Deborah, and Kristen. My boss ladies, Annie, Bethany, Bronwyn, Eva, Melissa, Nulia, Rebecca, and Faye and Whimsy Soapworks. My adventuresses, Iris, Jessica R., Kelly, Alexis, Kira, Lizzie, Samantha, Jessica S., and Karen C., my warrior queen Avery, and my lady pharaoh Courtney. If you like this episode, become a patron of the show and you'll get hours more like it, along with mini-sodes about everything from the history of high heels to bomb women inventors. Thanks for supporting the Explores. A quick note. You can listen to this episode independently of my series on Cleopatra, but I think you'll enjoy it all that much more if you listen to those first. Also, Cleopatra is glorious, so get into it. Cleopatra was a boss lady who loomed large during her lifetime as one of the most successful monarchs of the East. But there were other royal women in the countries around her, suffering the same trials and very few of the same triumphs. Two of those women, Alexandra and Mariamne, princess of Judea, become friends with Cleopatra. And why not? They too were forced to marry their relatives and make sacrifices to hold onto power. They too were born into a dying dynasty, struggling to keep it all together under the threat of Roman rule. And they too are smart in scheming and full of rage at the limitations placed on women in their time and place. They are what Cleopatra might have been with a different roll of the dice of fate. They tantalized me as I worked on Cleo's story, but I couldn't quite make them fit within it. So here I present the story of Alexandra, Mariamne, and the demise of the Hasmonean Empire. It's also the story of one of Cleopatra's greatest rivals and one of the hottest messes in the ancient world, Herod the Great. To start, we have to learn a few things about the Hasmonean dynasty that ruled Judea for a very long time. Remember back when Alexander the Great died and his royal bros split up his bounty? When Ptolemy got Egypt, he decided to let his neighbor Judea more or less alone, letting them practice Judaism under a system managed by high priests. But then in the 3rd century BCE, the Seleucid Empire moved in, kicking out the Ptolemies and taking control with an iron fist. They were like, you know what? Let's root out Judaism and replace it with Greek culture and religion. Religious suppression, that's fine. The Jews, being quite fond of their way of doing things, were not at all into this. Things came to a violent head when one of the Seleucid rulers defiled a very important temple and the Jews decided they'd had quite enough. A country priest named Mattathias and his five sons throw their hands up and volunteer to lead the revolt against their repressors, which they do well enough to start being called the Maccabees, a word that apparently means the hammer. When it's all over, they're left with a newly semi-independent Judea, a theocratic state led by, you guessed it, the Maccabees. It is the last surviving Maccabee brother, Simon, who becomes ruler and high priest. He kicks off the Hasmonean dynasty that will rule Judea for a century, despite the many coups and intrigues that get in their way. It doesn't always help that they often turn on each other. It also doesn't help that the Roman Empire, as Cleopatra is also learning around this time, is not one to leave well enough alone. Let's start into this tangled mess of a dynasty with Aristobulus I. 
He may have been the first formal king of Judea, though we aren't 100% sure about it. He does a surprising amount during his brief rule from 104 to 103. He expands Judea's borders into the neighboring land of Galilee, then forces all the men there to get circumcised and take on Jewish customs. He's also not afraid to get the snippers out for his family members, imprisoning his mom and starving her, killing one of his brothers and throwing the other three in jail. Dude is busy. But the reason we're talking about Aristobulus at all is to introduce his bomb wife, Salome Alexandra. When her hubby dies in 103, she takes over as queen and, as Jewish historian Josephus tells us, rules a lot more effectively than he did. She was sagacious in the highest degree in the exercise of authority and demonstrated by her acts her practical understanding of politics, which far exceeded that of the men, who constantly came to grief in affairs of government. She did keep her people in peace throughout her reign. She starts by releasing all those imprisoned brothers-in-law and, to stay in power, she marries one, a guy named Alexander Janaeus. She suffers through 27 years in the passenger seat through civil war and foreign conquest until he finally dies of living way too large in 76 BCE. Supposedly, when on his deathbed, he tells his wife to reconcile with the Pharisees, a rather more flexible sect of Judaism that, some suggest, is much enjoyed among aristocratic women like Alexandra, and share the government with them. When she becomes queen again, set to rule alone for the next nine years, she does just that. But things get complicated when her sons take charge. We're talking about Mariamne's grandfathers here, Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II. Hyrcanus II had only been ruling a few months in 67 BCE when his brother Aristobulus rebelled against him. Hyrcanus was apparently like, Yeah, fine. I don't really want to be king anyway. And went back to being a prince. No big deal. But then Antipater, the governor in our neighboring state of Idumea, is like, Hey bro, you know what would be cool? If you took the crown back, then gave my four sons high up positions in your court. Just a thought. And Hyrcanus is like, Yeah, why not? And starts a messy civil war with his brother that only ends when Papa Rome intervenes. They roll up in the form of Pompey the Great, the guy who Cleopatra's brother will behead in a few years. Right now, he's still a big deal general, and he takes things in hand in Judea, as Rome is wont to do. The Hasmoneans are now in the same position as Cleo and so many other Eastern monarchs. How to stay independent, but also stay on Rome's good side. How to keep them from taking over entirely. Hyrcanus too is now in charge again, but Rome is stage managing the whole business from afar. The Judeans are proud, and rightly so, and a lot of them don't like this even one little bit. But that guy Antipater is happy, as he's long been a friend to Rome, and now he's able to be Hyrcanus's chief advisor. I mention this because one of his sons is about to feature quite prominently in our tale. Now we get to Mary Amney's parents. I know that everyone having the same three names gets rather tiresome, but we've got a soldier on. Her dad is Alexander, the son of Aristobulus II. He makes the family lineage even twistier when he marries his cousin Alexandra, who is the daughter of Hyrcanus II. That means that both Mariamne and her brother, another Aristobulus, are Hasmonean royalty on both sides of the family. But like Cleopatra, she and her mom Alexandra are born into an increasingly fractured country and a dynasty that is only one or two steps away from toppling. She's born sometime around 54 BCE. Mariamne, by the way, is the Hellenized version of the Hebrew name Miriam. Predictably, we know nothing about her childhood other than the fact that she existed. We don't hear about her until she hits puberty, when we find out that she is quite a beautiful sight. She and her brother are both real lookers, and they're Jewish royalty, so of course their list of suitors is long and varied. Mama Alexandra, quite a strong woman in her own right, wants both her kids to rise to power, as is their right. But the person Granddad Hyrcanus II hitches Mary Amney's wagon to is a guy named Herod, one of the sons of Antipater. Let's talk about Antipater and Herod for a minute, because this is backstory we'll need to know. Antipater has been pulling strings behind the scenes in Judea for years. 
Just like the Ptolemies over in Egypt, he cannily sided with Julius Caesar rather than Pompey when the First Roman Civil Wars rolled around. He was even made a Roman citizen in 47 and appointed the governor of Judea for his loyalty, as well as his son Herod, who was made the governor of Galilee next door. They are powerful, but not very popular. It's important to know that a lot of them don't consider Herod Jewish at all. While he grew up there, his father is actually Idumean, and his mom is the daughter of a noble from the Nabataean city of Petra, which features heavily in Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail. Since Jewish law dictates that you're only really Jewish if your mother is, some of Jerusalem's conservatives consider him an outsider from the get-go. And so he'll go through life with a chip on his shoulder and a very tiny Jewish man complex, always wanting to gain acceptance and always irrationally angry when he doesn't get it. In 44 BCE, it's no surprise that Antipater gets himself murdered while collecting silver for Cassius, one of Caesar's assassins. Seeing how the winds are changing, Herod pledges his troth to Mark Antony and Octavian after they defeat Caesar's killers. For his loyalty, Antony makes Herod and his brother tetrarchs, or rulers of a quarter, in Judea. By 43, Herod is governor and kind of a big deal, but he'll go on to become one of ancient history's least popular tyrants. He's the guy who, according to the Bible, hears that a king of the Jews has been born and orders all infant boy babies be murdered immediately. But right now, he's just a 32-year-old boy, standing in front of a 12-year-old girl, asking her to love him. And she's like, um, ew. Also, he's already married to a girl named Doris. Also, he's not even royal. Mom! But Mom is savvy. She knows that Herod is in a position of real power and influence, but he needs a Hasmonean bride to solidify his claims and realize his ambitions. To her, this engagement is an insurance policy for her family. And Grandpa Hyrcanus needs his troops and money to try and hold off the Parthians, so he tells her to pull up her big girl pants. This is happening. And as a royal daughter, Mariamne must know there isn't much she can do but agree. While she waits in dread for her wedding, the Parthians storm Jerusalem. But not alone, they've teamed up with a guy named Antigonus, Mariamne's uncle, who is angling to take over from Hyrcanus too. Given that the Jewish crowds clap and chant his name as he invades, keen to resurrect the good part of the Hasmonean dynasty who doesn't lick any Roman boots, it's pretty clear to Hyrcanus that popular opinion is not on his side. So he tries to strike a deal with Antigonus rather than fight him, and he promptly finds himself under house arrest and has his ears cut off so he can no longer be high priest. Oh my. This is not a good situation for Mariamne, of course, and definitely not for Herod. He skedaddles right out of Judea, barely escaping with his life. He bumps around for a bit, trying to find someone with money willing to help him out. But no one wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Parthians or get involved in Judea's hot mess. Finally, he heads over to Egypt to meet with our girl, Cleopatra. At this point, she's already hooked up with Mark Antony and continues to be one of the Eastern world's most powerful rulers. These two actually have a lot in common. They're both big personalities with big egos and big plans. Herod is larger than life, entertaining, smart and shrewd, passionate and great at kissing ass when he needs to. But he's also a mercurial sort, quick to anger and jealous as hell. Cleo throws him a nice little welcome party and listens to what he has to say. Hey, listen, I'm friends with Mark. You're sleeping with Mark. My dad helped your dad regain the throne back in the day. How about you lend me some troops and money, honey, so I can retake Jerusalem? Help a brother out. Um, sorry, I don't remember seeing you at the last Hasmonean family dinner party. Yeah, but I mean, I'm marrying into the dynasty, and I've got real leadership potential, and I'm really good at throwing a javelin, so... Look, I'll give you a job if you want, or a ship or something, but troops? Honey, you're a hot mess. Feeling sour, Herod takes that ship and sails to Rome, only to be shipwrecked off the coast of Cyprus. So when he finally gets to his destination, he's salty on a couple of levels. But that doesn't mean he isn't ready to charm who needs charming. 
He schmoozes with top dogs Mark Antony and Octavian, who at this point are still part of their second triumvirate. Won't they help him take the Judean throne? For Mary Amney's teenage brother, Aristobulus, obviously. We don't know exactly what he says, but by the time he's done with his negotiations, he, Mark, and Octavian are all buddy-buddy, and they've decided to make Herod the new king of Judea. Wait, me? You want me to be king? I mean, okay, if you think that's best. Totally. Then they all hold hands and make a sacrifice to Jupiter together, which I'm sure the religious folks back home just love. But never mind that. Herod's about to march back into Judea, flanked by Roman soldiers, and if the people refuse to love him, at least he'll make them fear him. Meanwhile, things at home are tense for Mary Amney and her mom. She's living every young bride's nightmare, trapped in the desert fortress of Masada with her future in-laws. She finds Herod's mom, Cyprus, and his sister Salome meddling in uppity, putting on airs they haven't earned, and always trying to stir the pot. Meanwhile, she is an actual Jewish princess who loathes the lowly man she's about to marry and everything he stands to ruin her dynasty, her legacy, her country. So she treats them like something the dog just threw up at her feet. I can't confirm whether or not Mary Amney's mom, Alexandra, is there with them, but let's assume she's in the mix. She also dislikes Herod at this point. How dare he do one over on her son Aristobulus and take the Judean crown for himself? It's no surprise, then, that all four of these women end up disliking each other quite profoundly. What starts out as an irritating itch will soon turn into a wound that festers, becoming something powerful enough to destroy the Hasmoneans. In the middle of recapturing Jerusalem, Herod takes a little water break in the middle of the action and is like, You know what? I think it's wedding time. He finalizes his divorce with Doris, kicks her and her son out of the city, Bye! gets his family out of Masada, and marries the 17-year-old princess. He is ecstatic, as he's kind of obsessed with Mary Amney, and getting hitched to her will solidify his claim. Though she is less enthused, apparently she doesn't put up a fight. Does she hope that their alliance will calm things down in her country? Does she think, loathsome as Herod might be, that being queen will give her the power and influence she's craving? It's hard to say, but you can bet it doesn't go as planned. Freshly married, Herod tucks his wife into Samaria for safekeeping and goes back to trying to take back Jerusalem. It takes months, partially because the people really, really don't want Herod becoming the boss of them. That turns out to be a valid fear, as when he and his Roman troops finally get into the city, they burn, pillage, and desecrate everybody a la Daenerys Targaryen and her dragon in King's Landing. Really starting off your kingship on a solid foot there, Herod. Once that's done, the whole family settles down in Jerusalem, though how easily or happily is anyone's guess. It's pretty well known, at least according to Josephus, who's basically our only source for any of this, that Herod is rather obsessed with his sexy young wife, and that Mary Amney does not return his feelings. But it's her duty to try and keep him happy and influence him in any way she can. Perhaps she's part of the reason that in 36 BCE, he invites deposed and earless grandpa Hyrcanus II back from exile to live as an honored guest at his court. Looked at one way, the Hasmoneans are still in positions of power, so close to running their country. Looked at another, they are fancy prisoners, always trying to find their way free. Then, in 34 BCE, Cleopatra breezes in on a wave of incense. She's returning to Egypt from Antioch, where she's just reunited with Mark Antony for the first time in several years. She brought their twins with her so Papa Mark could meet them, and they have what we can only imagine is a very hot and steamy reunion. While there, Mark Antony gives Cleo honors and valuable grants, and she's feeling pretty smug about it. That's why she's in Jerusalem, to negotiate the terms of those grants with Herod. Specifically, she wants to talk through the rights she's won to some valuable Dead Sea bitumen, important for building roads and things, and some precious balsam and date groves in Jericho. Herod has got to be stamping his foot over this one. He hasn't forgotten how she embarrassed him years ago by refusing to help him take Jerusalem back. Also, he doesn't like being emasculated by a powerful woman who has so many of the things he covets. 
a legitimate crown, the love of her people, and the love of his buddy Mark Antony. Also, he's had it pretty much up to here with domineering, interfering women. After all, he spends his days surrounded by them. But there's someone in Herod's court who is definitely a Cleo fan, and that's Mary Amney's mom. Alexandra and Cleo become fast friends during this visit. They have a lot in common. They're both from long royal lines plagued by bloody infighting. They are both married to family members, and they both struggle under the incompetence of the men around them. But unlike Alexandra, Cleopatra seems able to control her own destiny, and she has a lot of money and influence. Mary Amney must be a little bit starstruck by Cleopatra. I like to think of the three of them sipping on wine, trading recipes for killer bath soaks, and complaining about what a jerk hair it is. So wait, Cleo. You put the bees inside the gourd and then you put it down there? Apparently. Someone time traveled back to my palace the other day and told me history is going to claim I invented some kind of self-pleasure device. Isn't it fabulous? Yes, honey. Now tell me again about that recipe for bathing in ass's milk. The only source we have about how this visit goes down is Josephus, a Jewish historian who, it must be said, also becomes quite the Roman bootlicker. So let's take this all with a grain of dead sea salt. In their negotiations, Herod gets increasingly ragey. Judea is not a wealthy country, and it doesn't have much fertile soil. Egypt is Mediterranean's goddamn breadbasket. What does Cleo need his bitumen for? But he agrees to his terms, as Josephus tells us, because it would be unsafe to give her any reason to hate him. But if there's anything we can count on, it's the power of the irrational fury felt by an emasculated male. Hey, royal advisors, I've got an amazing plan. Let's murder Cleopatra. Um, better not. Why? We'll be doing Mark Antony a favor, as she's a conniving viper who will turn on him the first chance she gets. Again, no, just no. But you guys, she's a massive shameless slut and totally tried to seduce me just then. She told me that she's obsessed with me and then tried to force herself on my manhood. She's depraved, okay? Mark will thank me later. He will nail your manhood to the wall if you touch her. So... Herod escorts Cleo to the Egyptian border instead, probably hoping she'll die of heat stroke. Then he heads home, hoping to never have to deal with that Egyptian queen again. Good luck with that. Back at his desk, Herod realizes that he needs to appoint a new high priest. Luckily, as Mary Amney and Alexandra point out, there's the young and very attractive Aristobulus on hand. He's Hasmonean, which the people will like, and super pretty, which everyone likes. But he's also a pretty big threat to Herod's power, so maybe not. Instead, he gives the position to some Babylonian guy. This works the Hasmonean ladies into an absolute lather. Alexandra picks up her quill, scribbling a letter to her new sister-in-arms over in Egypt. Since she's under watch by an increasingly paranoid Herod, she gets a traveling musician to smuggle the letter out. Hey, Cleo, miss you. Ugh, do you know what that waste of space Herod is up to now? He's refusing to make my son high priest. Do you think you could talk to Mark and ask for his help? And Cleo writes back, Girl, I am here for this. A few months later, Delius just happens to show up in Jerusalem. Remember him, that persuasive man who once convinced Cleopatra to go and meet Mark Antony in Tarsus? He sidles on up to Alexandra and makes a helpful suggestion. Yo, why don't you have some portraits of your two super attractive children done up and sent over to Mark? If he likes what he sees, he's more likely to get involved. Especially if at some point he gets to sleep with them. Alexandra apparently takes this bizarre advice right on board. It's said that Mark is so taken with the portrait of Aristobulus that he asks for him to be sent to Alexandria right away. He'd probably have sent for Mary Amney too, but Cleo isn't one for sharing. But Herod sees what's going on and is like, Um, I don't think so. He publicly berates Alexandra, accusing her of meddling in state affairs when obviously women can't do politics and also of plotting with Cleopatra against him. Knowing she's in very hot water here, she turns on the waterworks, swearing that she only wanted her son to have what was due. She promises she'll be really, really good from now on. Herod does make Aristobulus priest in the end, mainly because he doesn't want him going to Mark Antony and charming him with his luscious good looks. 
but he also puts Alexandra under strict house arrest. He now knows for sure that she's a meddler and perhaps a dangerous threat to his crown. What's going on with Mary Amney in all this? Is Herod taking his anger out on her in public and in private? Is she having to use her sexual wiles to placate him even as she loathes him? Is she secretly scheming to take him off the throne? We don't know. We do know that Alexandra is unhappy enough to smuggle another letter out to Cleo, letting her know what's going down. Cleo's sympathetic, as always, and sends over a ship to smuggle her and Aristobulus to Alexandria. Apparently, Mary Amney is not part of the plan. Um, Mom, are you just gonna leave me here? Oh, sweetie, it isn't personal. I mean, I guess it is, but don't be mad. Maybe Alexandra doesn't want to invoke Herod's wrath by taking Mary Amney away from him. Maybe she's just playing favorites. Either way, Alexandra has only two coffins made for them to hide in just in case the ship gets raided. But Herod catches wind of the plan and intercepts the ship himself. He outwardly forgives Alexandra. No point in pissing Cleopatra off, after all. But inwardly, he is livid. Again, you have to wonder what kind of dangerous knife's edge Mary Amney is having to walk through all of this, trying to keep her husband happy while her family members work against him. This is a guy who is already paranoid. Some sources suggest he uses secret police to keep track of what the general populace is saying about him, and who actively suppresses public protests with violent force. So of course he's going to watch these Hasmoneans more carefully than ever, and they need to watch what they do and say. In 35 BCE, at the festival of Sukkot, Aristobulus wows the crowd in his high priest's gold diadem and gem-encrusted robes. It's becoming painfully clear to Herod that it's only a matter of time before someone plans a coup around his pretty brother-in-law. So a few days later, while Aristobulus is playing in a royal swimming pool, some of Herod's bros are like, Hey, let's play a game and see who can stay underwater for the longest. Aristobulus, you go first. Here, we'll help. They hold him under a little too long and he drowns. Oh no. Herod makes sure to arrange a lavish funeral and cry very loudly throughout. But the ladies in his life know their crocodile tears. Alexandra buries her rage down deep, knowing that revenge is a dish best served cold. But Mary Amney is done playing nice. She denounces Herod and his awful female family members as well. Herod pointedly pretends not to notice, since, honestly, he is still a little bit obsessed with her. Never mind that her hatred of him was as great as was his love of her, and that she's known to actually groan in displeasure when he tries to hug her in public. Cleo tries to get Mark to punish Herod for what is clearly his crime, but Mark's not so down. Herod might come in handy, he says, and he's a much more stable client ruler than those tempestuous Hasmonean ladies would be. Mark does summon Herod to Alexandria, though, to explain himself. Given that he's just killed her brother, Mary Amney must be pretty relieved to see him go. But before Herod leaves, he puts her under the protection of her uncle Joseph. He is married to Herod's sister, and Mary Amney's enemy, Salome. This will become important in just a hot little minute. Unbeknownst to Mary Amney, Herod also secretly tells Joseph that if he dies while away in Egypt, he should kill Mary Amney. He just loves her so much. He can't handle the idea that she might marry someone else after he's gone. Oh, Herod, that is super unhealthy. It's all kept very hush-hush until a rumor circles around Jerusalem that Mark Antony's planning to kill Herod after all. Feeling guilty, Joseph breaks down and tells Mary Amney about Herod's plans, urging her and Alexandra to run for it. Before they can, they get word that Herod's on his way back. His plan to shower Mark with gifts and compliments totally worked, despite Cleopatra's giving him dagger eyes the whole visit, and they're totally bros again. But he knows that Cleo is out for blood. Later, it's said that he fortifies Masada with grain, oils, dates, and wine out of fear that she'll attack him. But right now, he says that he's totally safe from that wicked woman and her desire to take him down. To which we can imagine Cleopatra saying, Oh, honey, it's cute that you think that. So Herod strolls into his sanctum, having missed his hot and wonderful wife, and goes to declare his passionate love for her. To which Mary Amney responds, You disgusting waste of space. I know you said that I should be killed if you were. <laughs> and now you want to cuddle? 
Go drown yourself in a pool, why don't you? The conniving sister Salome takes the opportunity to insert herself into the situation by telling Herod that, Hey bro, guess what? My gross husband Joseph and your terrible wife totally knocked boots while you were gone. Sorry. At that, Herod and his fragile ego shatter just a little bit. He already knows his wife doesn't love him. But for her to sleep with someone else? Uh, no, 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 no. He kills Joseph immediately, puts Alexandra back under house arrest for good measure, because obviously she must have been involved, somehow, and talks a pretty big game about killing his wife. In Hebrew law, a woman can be accused of adultery even if her husband is only jealous without any specific proof, and the punishments can be quite severe. Mary Amney fervently denies the ugly rumor, and apparently does such a good job of seducing Herod that he totally forgives her. My, does this couple need counseling. At the end of it all, Mary Amney has to have a bone-deep hatred of Salome, who caused her uncle's death and nearly hers as well. Over the next few years, things seem at least outwardly better. Herod builds a bunch of cool stuff, and Mary Amney bears him a son, a future heir. But behind closed doors, things are still pretty ugly in the Hasmonean Herodian household. Mary Amney and her mom continue to disrespect Herod's female family members. And in turn, Salome and Cyprus do everything they can to undermine the stuck-up Hasmoneans. And then their world is rocked when the news comes in that Octavian has declared war against Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Herod is first in line to rush to Antony's side and help him out. But when things start going sour in their camp and Herod starts encouraging Mark to send Cleo away, or maybe just kill her, Cleopatra's like, Ugh, every breath you take annoys me and convinces Antony to send him and his troops to fight the Nabataeans instead to get some back taxes they owe her, which will help fund their efforts. Sneaky as hell, Cleo then sends some of her own troops to help out the Nabataeans, hoping that Herod will be annihilated on the battlefield. But then she has to recall those troops to help out at the Battle of Actium, which sadly, they end up losing. Eventually, it's Octavian who emerges victorious, and those who sided with Antony have to deal with his wrath. But not Herod, conveniently, because he wasn't at the battle. Cleopatra unwittingly helped him out in the end. How unfortunate. When Herod goes on a trip to kiss Octavian's boots, he makes sure to separate the two halves of his household before leaving. This time, he leaves his wife under the care of a guy named Sohemus, who is told, once again, that if he dies while away, Mary Amney should be killed. Cute. And you know what? This time, let's kill Alexandra too, just for the hell of it. The minute he's gone, predictably, Alexandra urges her dad here Canis too. Yup, that guy's still around, and apparently about as helpful to his female family members as a wet rag in a rainstorm, to flee to Nabatea, fearing that as the last male Hasmonean, he'll soon be killed as well. But her message is intercepted, and Herod is only too delighted for a legit excuse to get rid of the old guy. At this point, Mary Amney has had enough. When Herod returns and goes to his wife for a little horizontal tennis time, she denies him outright, saying that she's had it up to her eyeballs with the way he's murdered her brother and uncle and granddad. I mean, nothing kills the mood like your husband killing your family. And the emotionally tone-deaf Herod is like, Ugh, seriously? You're still mad about that? Come on, sweetie. Sometimes a king's just got a king. But she stands firm. Sister Salome, who is forever hovering nearby, eavesdropping from behind big palm fronds, sees another opportunity. She has the royal cupbearer tell Herod that Mary Amney tried to get him to give the king a love potion. But he didn't, because he feared it was actually poison. Ugh. And also, Salome says, I'm pretty sure she slept with Sohemus while you were gone, so that sucks. Mary Amney knows she should take Herod to bed and make him forget his anger. But she is done being a slave to his whims, to bowing down to a man she doesn't love or respect. She's just done. And so after months of his sister and mom whispering in his ear, Herod decides to get some answers by torturing her favorite eunuch. He finds out nothing about any plot against him, but he does find out that his wife really, really hates him. So he kills the eunuch, orders Sohemus' execution, and puts Mary Amney on trial for suspected poisoning.
And then, as Mary Amney walks to her trial, her mom Alexandra publicly betrays her daughter, accusing her of being a threat to the king, tearing at her clothes and eyes. Maybe her spirit is broken by the years of death and house arrest. Perhaps she's just trying to survive the day. Either way, Mary Amney doesn't seem surprised. The court gapes in horror, but she stands cool and calm, refusing to break down. And for this, they all respect her more. Herod does think about just keeping her in prison. Just kill her already, the ever-helpful Salome whispers. Let's get you a new, less annoying wife. Agonized, paranoid, and full of guilt, he finally agrees. And so it is that at just 28 years old, Mary Amney is put to death. What could she have accomplished had the dice she rolled looked more like Cleopatra's? If she had had the chance to rise to power, to become the shepherdess of Judea, we'll never know. Afterward, Herod is racked with guilt and grief. After all, he might have ten wives in his lifetime, but Mary Amney's definitely his favorite. Apparently, he has Mary Amney's body covered in honey to preserve her beauty, which is… sweet, I guess? No, I think I meant gross. He retreats to the desert to mourn, and Alexandra takes the opportunity to take over two fortresses. It's the last straw. Herod has her murdered. And so ends the tortured Hasmonean dynasty. But it gets worse. Sister Salome is also given credit for having Mary Amney's two children with Herod, Aristobulus, and Alexander killed. Although, frankly, this sounds like an ancient male writer wanting to paint a powerful woman as monstrous. So I'm happy to leave the blame squarely on Mr. Herod's shoulders. Some sources say that Mary Amney's death only spurs him on to greater acts of cruelty. But you'll be happy to know that he eventually dies of kidney disease and a rare infection that causes gangrene of the genitals. Payback is hell. Was Mary Amney a powerless pawn forced to placate a high-strung, brutal husband? How much agency did she actually have? And what about her mom? What do we make of the way she treated her daughter? We have only the barest scraps of their stories, and no way to know what it was like to live the lives they did. But we can imagine the well of strength and determination they must have had to make it through life in such a tumultuous situation. If fate had treated them differently, we might know them better. But we can appreciate them nonetheless. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, tell a friend, leave a review on your podcatcher of choice, and make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. It all really helps other people discover it. You can also support the show over on Patreon with a recurring or one-time donation, or purchase some art from my Etsy shop. If you want to hear more about the fabulous Salome Alexandra, I highly recommend What's Her Name's episode on her called The Last Queen of Judea. For show notes, including a transcript, images, suggested reading, and more, go to my website, theexplorespodcast.com. Come find me on Instagram and Facebook at The Explores Podcast and Twitter at The Explores Pod. As always, thanks to Mr. Explores, aka Paul Gablonski, for my theme music, logo, and help producing this episode. Thank you.